Welcome back to the Masters of Materium. And today we got a really special show because we have a very special guest. He's been one of my favorite content creators even before he joined Mom. And I'm talking about Jake the Hammerham. And Jake, welcome to the Masters of Materium podcast. I appreciate that. Yeah, I was super stoked when you guys asked me to hop on here because this is going to be a super fun video. This hasn't been done yet. And I'm, I'm very excited for it. So. Yeah, we did the building tier video. A lot of people love that and there's been requests for an exemplar tier video. Of course, we've done videos on all the exemplars, all the different tiers, and so is Jake. But as Jake just said, we've never done a comparison of all the different exemplars level by level. Let's get right into it, Grill. And I think we should start with the F tier. <laughs> Let's just get it out of the way. You know where I'm going with this. I mean, should we just throw the pit fighters right down where it belongs? Ooh, I, I actually, I actually have something nice to say about pit fighters today. I'm not gonna lie. Okay. All and right, don't forget go. the dark suns. <laughs> Thinking about the pit fighters, obviously they seem pretty bad on the surface, and I've uh, expressed that opinion a few times with a couple different rants. You know, you go on open sea. How much does a pit fire now? Thirty bucks, forty bucks? I don't even know. I haven't been keeping close check on them, but. For an entry to a free-to-play game where most AAA games are, you know, 50, 60, 70 bucks now, uh, and early access is sometimes as much as 100, I, I think that's not a bad price. And of course, the other exemplars are cheap too. But I was also thinking the Pit Fighters could potentially be like the entry way into more even adventuring class when they can go out and hunt. So I don't know if they're specifically only for PvP. We just know that they're unarmed, right? But what if unarmed includes something like a claw weapon or a fist type weapon like brass knuckles and they can actually go out there and kill some stuff barehanded or you know maybe they have different classes which is something that really hasn't been discussed too much even by the miranda's team you know maybe they could be like a monk or a karate fighter or something i still don't think that they're great but i think they have potential to be a cheap entry point into something that a lot of people want to do which is venturing out in the wild you're making me bullish jake do you think there's a, sh a chance that pit fighters get a melee buff. Oh yeah, no, I absolutely see that. And the way that they're they've talked about skills, I think that that's that's totally a possibility. And so to kind of piggyback off of what you had talked about, Grill, for a second, the budget friendliness of these guys, they're not going to need a weapon. So that's one thing that you wouldn't have to buy when you're rocking this character. So if you buy one of these guys for thirty bucks right now, that's Tick it into Miranda's and you won't have to worry about purchasing any weapons more than likely. I mean, maybe a weapon will be better than their melee. We don't really know, but uh, that's something else to consider. They could have good ROI, right? Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Could be really cheap to run. But yeah, do you think uh, Grill they'll, they'll have a melee boost beyond just with fist clubs and things like that? Mm, it seems like they really want them to be unarmed, so maybe... They only get that buff when unarmed or when using very specific weapon types. Do you agree that it's the worst exemplar, though? That being said, and you made me a little more bullish, but can we just throw it at the very bottom? With the current information, yeah, I think that they're probably still the worst exemplar. They do potentially, or they do have some potential to maybe be kind of like, I don't want to say secret OP because I think that's probably giving them a little too much credit, but... Uh, potentially a little better than they seem on the surface. Uh, so for now, we'll take them and we'll drop them right here next to the D. And and one thing to say, from an ROI perspective, based on the last playtest, which of course could change in the next playtest, it would actually have the highest ROI because it's the cheapest. So That's right. I was hoping for an epic rant of the pit fighters. <laughs> well, you got one, just maybe not the one you expected. And also, uh, I'm, it, we were kind of talking about this beforehand. Keep in mind, this is a very subjective uh, tier list. I mean, there's some objectivity to it. Like, there's some factual information. But, I mean, it's, it's all based around your play style. So this is just kind of total speculation here. These guys, they could be super crazy. But, I mean, the odds of that actually happening are pretty slim. So, but who knows? two ways to basically look at exemplars. One is fun. So for people that just want to play Mirandus and have maximum fun, and you want to pick, of course, the right type of exemplar based on your play style. And the second is really kind of the maximum ROI and the economy of Mirandus is going to be incredibly dynamic because we're all going to be forced to specialize, whether it's sport, specializing in alchemy or goldsmithing or green cloaks etc so 
you, we're going to see the economy shift a lot once it's live. You know, if there's an, a big gaping hole in one type of a market, you're going to see people shift over to that exemplar and try to capitalize on that. So it's going to be a very dynamic uh, economic answer to that question. Actually, I do have one more thing before we leave. Um, sure. In the beginning, when uh, weapons are going to be pretty trash, like, you know, the world of Miranda's first opens up, we have super basic weapons. These guys might honestly have uh, an edge just in, in the way of their progression. So these guys could be a little bit more popular in the beginning since they will have a more powerful melee. That's something else to kind of think about. Maybe different exemplars in different um, stages of the game's development. Yeah, something some could scale better, like you know, first couple months, year, or something. Something might be very powerful because it has attributes that are advantageous at that point in time. And then over time, maybe not so much. There's another example where I have the same kind of feeling about. We'll get to it in a little bit, uh, where I think it might be really good in the early stages of the game and development, and then kind of fall off a bit. It's absolutely right. And so in the very beginning, like you kind of mentioned, the first year, I'm thinking the very first day uh, when. You- people are are just you know they're set out on the beach and they run around and i think that it talked about releasing people in waves of their deed ownings so maybe people who own uh, you know higher deeds will be first and whatnot if you find that the deed plot and you put your deed down like it's, it's first come first serve so you need as much of an advantage as you can so these guys actually could potentially have a bit of a an edge there because they I mean, obviously, you know, some people or some exemplars might be able to run faster or whatnot, but these guys could do more damage than um, than the others. So that that could be a potential day one advantage. Maybe you need them to kind of fight through the wilderness early on. Okay, so up next we have the Riders of the North. The obvious use case is going to be for horse breathers, which I think is going to be a market in the game. After playing the game and knowing how big this world's going to be, Horses are going to be almost a necessity. So I, I do definitely see a, a strong economic use case for Riders of the North Hammer. I'm, I'm looking at Miranda Sub right now. I'm looking at their ability, and it just says bonus to all horse skills and abilities. Now, I don't know if that means breeding. Obviously, it's going to mean, you know, the different abil- skills that the, the horses have, because I think some depending on the horse's tier and stuff, they have different abilities and whatnot. But um, so maybe it just enhances that. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like it's pretty pretty straightforward. They did confirm during the horse sale that uh, the riders would buff the horses, the breeding somehow. So Okay, cool. Real? I think they'll be good. I think there's not a lot of breeding pairs of horses out there. How many riders in the north do you really need for that one, especially when you know there's 2,500 of them? Where I do think they'll be useful is either for mounting combat, potentially, since they have a bonus to all skills and abilities, or for just... Getting places really fast. They can, if a horse could use half the energy and go twice the speed with a rider of the north on it, then I mean, there's going to be no better way to get around. Or maybe you can run like a, some kind of like Miranda's Express delivery service. Same day, right? Some white glove <laughs> service. So yeah, I think they'll be pretty good. I don't think they're going to be exceptionally powerful. I think if like all the horses sold, I'd probably place them a little higher. But with so few breeding pairs... I think that's limiting their utility uh, slightly. Yeah. Again, if we're looking at supply and demand, there's definitely most likely more supply than demand. So, grill D tier? Maybe like bottom C tier. We could shift some stuff around if we feel differently once we put some more stuff in there. But I think just the ability to get around really quickly or be strong in mounted combat, depending on how prevalent mount the combat is within uh, Miranda's that they might deserve to be a little higher up. I would say like low C, high D. Yeah, that that's hard. Um, I would kind of agree with that, like low C, high D. I was kind of thinking D, but I could also see these guys being a C because if someone really wow. went deep into the uh, into horse breeding, like, this guy could could have a really good ROI. Like he, he might be necessary for that. So I've been outvoted. So you guys both said high D tier. We'll put it in high D tier. All right. Above Next Pit up Fighter. on the above everything's above Pit Fire here. Pit <laughs> Fighter will put like over here. Nah. Um oh, they got reversed. There we go. Okay. Up next we have the Alchemists. 
I think it's one of the strongest humans. I think it's potion making is going to be an incredibly high demand. It's a consumable. I think most serious adventurers are going to want potions. Definitely. It's the one human I feel like pushing to almost B tier. Definitely high C tier. That's where I would put it. Hammer. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. This is going to be one of the, if we're talking ROI, this is probably going to be one of the best humans, just because, as you mentioned, potions are consumables. And if you look at uh, potion stands, potion buildings, I don't remember. What's the, what's the medium-sized potion building called? Potion there shop, potion stand, and large potion shop. Yeah, those are some of the most expensive buildings. Um, so that's also kind of where, you know, not as many horses sold, so not as many of the riders of the north are going to be used. Maybe you could say the same thing about the alchemist because there's not going to be as many potion shops, potion stands and stuff like that. But that doesn't take away the fact that they're going to be necessary. My counter to that is that every single potion shop, large, small, and otherwise should be placed. I don't see. That's true. Uh, with how with how few of those buildings there are, I see pretty much every potion shop wanting being on the ground with landowners or deed owners potentially even paying people to place like you know their larges in their towns because they're going to be such a big draw there's only 10 of them so two per kingdom so my guess is probably one goes in a citadel and another one goes in one of the duke prince and archdukes because you want to be in a town that's high foot traffic with your with really rare and expensive building as far as the alchemists go they are very specialized they make potions they don't do anything else so that maybe limits the utility in terms of the grand scheme of the whole game but that said potions are consumables they're rare they're powerful generally i mean we don't have any information exactly on what the potions are and what they'll do but from my mmo experience and in other games potions uh, can kind of make or break you sometimes and i think that uh, an example of that will be in high demand at all times to be constantly be pumping out those potions to keep the game kind of going i got a question real fast uh, before mm-hmm. we get too too f- much further into this, so have we learned whether or not you will need a potion shop, stand, etc., to actually create potions or to, to brew the potions, or are these exemplars just going to be able to craft potions via their inventory or something? I'm, I'm guessing it's going to be at the shops because otherwise, at the valley, is the shops quite a bit. Unless the potions they can make, a, they might be able to make some really simple potions. I think there was a, some some discussion on this at one point. Though, that was a while back, and I can't quite recall it. But they might maybe some really simple potions they can make out in the wild. But if they can craft too much on the run, then it severely devalues the potion shops, which I don't think they want to do. And that would definitely increase the value of the alchemist if that was the case. Yeah, the alchemist would be a lot better because they could just run around and. <laughs> like a traveling salesman, <laughs> just make potions and sell them to people out in the wild. Yeah, I don't really see that being a thing. It just wouldn't fit in with the rest of the game. <clears throat> I'm just picturing an alchemist next to a major fight, and he's just crafting and selling potions in real time. <laughs> he's like opening up his cloak, and he's got like a whole bunch of them on the inside of the cloak, right? With like little price tags above each one. <laughs> Two small healths for five materium right over here. Come get it while it's hot. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. As far as placement... I think for the like kind of singular focus crafting exemplars, they're probably among the best, if not the very best, uh, along with maybe the goldsmiths, which we'll come up to here shortly. So I would think maybe low B, high C, somewhere in that range. A low B is where I would put it. Low B? I was okay, almost thinking you? low A, high B. Oh, there's, so, there's some powerful exemplars coming up. There are some powerful exemplars coming up. Yeah. And, we're, only, and, we're only ramping up from here, so <laughs> that's true. Um, yeah, I'm kind of thinking like high B, low A, just because the the need of this guy is going to be so high. Uh, but then again, you know, not very many of them are likely going to get used. So, and, and there's also 2,500 of them. I think they're probably that's all, true. They yeah. should balance the shops around. If there's 100 percent placement of shops, then every po- al- alchemist should be needed. 24 7 to run them that, that you know that's how they should ideally balance this though yeah then i'm happy with the b they are first uh first example out of detail we're getting places here <laughs> up next we have the cartographers so obviously very important exemplar but it's got some problems one it needs ex- escorts 
with a lot of the crafting ones, you can just kind of go to your town and yeah, maybe a creature walks in once in a while. But I think the odds of survival for a cartographer being by itself is close to zero as we saw in the last playtest. Yeah. So that's an issue. Also, I'm I'm worried about map inflation. I think if you have a map, I'm assuming the utility of it's going to last quite a while. Like I don't see the terrain, the map changing that much or needing new maps. So important, but in my opinion, D tier. Hammer. See, they had that that is a hard one because I do remember them talking about um, once a map is created, it, then like the an area that they just mapped out is going to be reset. So map inflation will be an issue. And what's going to prevent someone like me, for instance, finding a map and throwing it up on Miranda's Hub? You know, what's going to keep people from sharing it on YouTube, Twitter, whatever? So I would probably... I'd say low B, high C, uh, just because maps will for sure be necessary. So this is a, an example where early on I was really bullish on. I bought like 35 or 40 of them. I had a bunch of them at one point. You mentioned map inflation, which was a good way to kind of... Early on, I think they might be the single most important exemplar because there's no map in that game other than a completed zone or once you completely discover a zone with a cartographer, you get a mini map as long as it's in your inventory. Like you said, with map inflation. Now, I don't know if... Things will change enough to where cartographers will need to consistently be put out into the wild and map things. If that's the case, then they will continue to be incredibly strong, I think. But I do worry about their long-term viability. It was kind of what we discussed with the pit fires, where things, the scaling over the longer term of the game, like initially where these things could be very powerful, after a while they could become quite useless. And just like Hammer said, anyone could take a screenshot of a map and share it anywhere. Now, maybe having the map in your inventory unlocks certain things in game, so you still might want to own one. But just just the information and having the knowledge of what a zone and how it's laid out is really important, and you can do that just by sharing a picture of the map. And I would probably put these D tier for now. This is probably the example I'm most interested in hearing more about from the Miranda's team. So if you guys are listening, on the next AMA, this one or the one after, I would love to hear a little bit how these exemplars could be viable in the longer term. Because on the surface, they look like they're going to suffer there. One thing that could really provide a lot more value to the cartographers would be if they can see kind of the general area where there's a treasure or things like that. Maybe as the mastery level of the cartographers gets really up there, it can start identifying things that are just not visible on the low level of mastery cartographers. That would be a game changer, right? If you could see, actually see, maybe not the exact exact location, but you could see some interesting details that are just not visible otherwise. Maybe there's puzzles, you know, that can only be figured out or seen by cartographers. So that's something where, okay, an adventure party, we have to bring one. Otherwise, we'll limit our ability to do things in the in this high level zone that we're trying to farm. That could be, but you know, again, there's 2,500 of them. They're 05 percent of the entire Miranda's population. That alone makes the humans a lot weaker in general. Uh, just because there's so many other people that can do what you're trying to do. There's going to be a lot of competition, especially if things are limited in any way, shape, or form. I, I think D for now with potential to be like quite high if some of the information revealed about these in the longer term. It also um, completely depends on the time of the game. Kind of like what you talked about and what we talked about with the... Um with the alchemists or sorry, not the alchemist with the, the pit fighters in the very beginning of the game, the release month two, six, I don't know. They could be as high as a B tier. I mean, they, they could be up there, but once more and more maps are created, then it's, it's definitely going to fight that map inflation. So I would agree with you for sure. A thousand zone world. Yeah. Maybe it takes a really long time to map everything and they're just going to be busy. Right. You know, in, in a 10 zone world, 2,500 cartographers, it's not going to take very long for the B like maps to be basically worthless. But that kind of goes for everything, right? I mean, 50,000 exemplars in a 10 zone world is going to be quite crowded. Kind of a, probably a general thing about the whole game, early on at least. Up next, we have the Goldsmiths. Definitely another alchemist level exemplar. The, o the only downside a little bit is obviously jewelry is not going to be consumable. So I, I don't think they're going to be as valuable as an alchemist, but incredibly valuable. 
But I do hope, which it sounded based on some Discord chats that happened a long time ago, is you'll be able to melt things down so that way the resources are reharvestable. If that's the case, and let's say the goldsmiths are the only ones that can do that, or maybe they get a buff when you're melting, smelting things back down, I would see them even, that would really boost their value. So hard to say, but definitely I'd say low B tier, that's where I'd put it. Hammer? Yeah, this one's this one's also a hard one. I'm probably going to say it's a hard one about every single exemplar because it is, because we don't know a whole lot. But jewelry in almost any MMO is always way more expensive than just about any other gear piece. But there's also like 2,500 of these guys. So I think that a few of them will could make a killing. Like if you, if you just focused on jewelry crafting with this exemplar and you put all your time and effort into this guy and he was your main exemplar and you were working at a high traffic place, your ROI could be crazy. You're crafting literally end, like the best jewelry in the game. People are going to pay a lot of money for that. But the fact that there's 2,500 of them, that's not everyone can be king. So I'd, I'd say high C, low B. Similar to the alchemists in that they work at the rarest shops. A little bit, I don't think they'll have the same level. They won't be quite as good as the alchemists because they said potions are extremely consumable. Do potentially craft something that's consumable in the way of enchants. Now, maybe enchants aren't permanent. Maybe you have to do them every hour or two hours or once a day. Or maybe some are permanent, but they're really expensive. Maybe some jewels are temporary. They could make almost anything consumable, right? Like, it really depends on how they design these things. But I'm, I'm pretty much feel like they're alchemists, but a little worse. I'd probably place them like just behind. Yeah, you know, the other thing is that their jewelers should have a little more interaction with other buildings where potion shops mostly feel like it's going to be for people using potion adventures. You know, maybe jewel crafters craft things for decorations to upgrade buildings. So they might have some extra utility in that way as well. One thing that's really worth highlighting is... One of the best aspects of the economic design of Mirandus is specialization. All the humans, a lot of the halflings, of course, pretty much every exemplar has a specialization, but it's a little bit less important on the adventuring side, but on the crafting side, it's huge. And it's going to be even more huge if the mastery levels are pushing things up further and further and further in terms of the output or the speed or the buffs for different things. And Hammer hit a key point, which is let's say a goldsmith level 100, like what's the value of that exemplar? Because let's say somebody's been grinding eight, 10 hours a day for a year, two years. The value of that exemplar for that player, again, for somebody who owns a large jewelry shop would be incredible because they could produce hopefully the best jewelry. So hopefully the crafted items produced by the humans are proportionate again not you don't want it to be game breaking but proportionate to the mastery level because that'll really provide a lot of value to the grinders and people that spend the time in the game what's your thoughts on that grill well i think it provides value to their time right just like you're saying so if somebody wants to spend the time and grind it out and they have the best goldsmith in the whole game there should be a lot of added value to that even if it's just a human that alone should be incredibly value now you know, maybe they have patterns that no one else can make or they could craft mass amounts of stuff or some certain decoration or ring or enchant that no one else can do. Yeah, I, I agree that mastery level should factor in quite a bit to the value of each individual exemplar. One last thing, one final thought is if we're thinking of alchemists as having the ability to potentially craft on the go, crafting jewelry on the go is going to be completely pointless. We don't know for sure that's the case with alchemist, but if jimmy sitting in the back playing with a necklace while we're over here fighting some minotaurs like <laughs> it's gonna be kind of pointless i really don't see much being able to be done in the field it's it, it would devalue the whole kind of the whole set it just doesn't yeah i just don't think it fits in with the current with with mccarthy thinking or the whole kind of design of the game itself so, right, so low b tier behind the alchemist yeah. Yeah. i think it kind of makes the most sense all right up next the green cloaks saw in the last playtest how important wood is and i think it's going to be even more important once the real game launches building fences for deeds sounds like it's going to be a big deal hopefully there's repair and green cloaks are again used there i definitely think green cloaks are going to be chopping a lot of wood <laughs> and they're going to be busy so yeah i'd probably put it you know c tier lower c tier hammer 
Yeah, so I actually really like these guys. When I was recording my video on human exemplars, I actually bought one of these guys after I posted the video because I'm like, you know what? I talked myself into one of these guys. <laughs> and the reason is, is because they have two bonuses. Uh, they're they're kind of hand in hand, but they have two different things. So wood gathering, which is obviously the cutting of the trees, and carpentry, which is the actual construction. So we've already talked about, um, or I, I think it was mentioned in one of the, um, at, at some point, that buildings are going to be upgradable. And so... With that said, I think that it, it would make sense that you would have to have a cartographer, or sorry, not a cartographer, a um, a green cloak, or some other exemplar work on upgrading that. So maybe you get like um, less crafting ingredients required when upgrading if using uh, a green cloak, or maybe less time. I don't know if I, I think that was kind of something that they weren't sure if they were going to do, like a time gated thing. But just the fact that he can gather wood, uh, and also work on wood items. And there could be, you know, like chairs, tables, different things like that that are craftable in the game, which would make sense for somebody who's good at carpentry to work on. So I don't know. I'd probably go C with this guy. A low C, high D. I think that as far as all the human exemplars, they might have the most utility. Wood will be used in across the board for a lot of things. They'll interact with almost every other building. They'll be important in arrow making and upgrades, fences, possibly ships, weapons. In terms of pure utility, I think they might be the highest of any of the human exemplars, or maybe the highest of any exemplar in the whole game. And they're one of the exemplars that will be farming and controlling a base resource, right? So you have ore, food, and wood, right? And this is one of the ones, and they control it by themselves. They don't share it. With anyone else, like, you know, there's five dwarves that all work on ore, but there's only one example that works on wood. As long as the game is popular, I see that these will be, I think these will be one of the highest, the examples that are in the highest demand uh, from building owners or from deed owners. Because I think there'll be a, a never, a hunger or thirst for wood that could just never be satisfied. Just based on other games I've played. I think from an overall game viewpoint, I think they're probably the highest of all the humans. In terms of a profitability standpoint, lower. I, I would place these guys somewhere in that B tier. I, I think maybe the profitability of the Alchemist and the Goldsmith are too uh, too strong to maybe place ahead of them, but I'd probably put it right behind them. I I'm pretty bullish on Green Cloaks, just based on experience and well, seeing we how much wood we've appeared to need in the playtest. We outvoted you, so we could put yeah. it high C. Okay. <laughs> Hearing you talk about it does make me, I, I didn't bullish. mention, yeah, yeah, just because, so with these guys, I feel like someone coming into the game that just wants to play the game and also make a little bit of money that doesn't need a good connection with um, the anybody in Miranda's that doesn't need to have different friends in different places or whatnot this guy can just go in he can just go cut trees and then he can go in and he can sell the wood and there's always as girl said somebody to buy the wood so this guy would be a really good one for somebody who just wants to play the game and make a little bit of money but grill also mentioned his profitability probably isn't going to be crazy high i i don't think that you know somebody with the crazy green cloak is just going to be uh, absolutely killing it with wood i mean maybe he can only cut certain wood that certain weapons need or something but i think i'm happy with c but i could even see yeah. low b you go in the manhattan you don't see too many lumber stores you see lots of jewelry stores though right <laughs> <laughs> good point you know, i i think overall they're going to be one of the highest demand very popular i think they'll probably be able to do some fighting on their own because they're equipped with an axe right so if you played um I know we always talk about Valheim, but I, I think I see so many, so many similarities between the two games. You know, if you're if you were chopping wood and something rolled up onto you, you can just turn around and start smacking that thing with the axe and really kind of fuck it up. So I think they'll have they'll they may not need escorts, especially if there's a team of them. They could probably swarm some low level enemies that are trying to uh, disrupt what they're doing. So yeah, I think green cloaks are going to be uh, a popular choice among players. Up next, we have the seafarers. So definitely one of the most important exemplars, based on what McCarthy said, you're going to need one to you know, move your ships. There's going to be 1,300 and 
70 ships in game, circulating supplies, 1,081. So, yeah, I think seafarers are going to be very busy. I, I think moving stuff around, going to islands is going to be a huge part of the game. So, yeah, to me, uh, high C or low B, I, I think it's, uh, it's just one of these critical exemplars you can't really work your way around. Hammer? Yeah, I think the... Uh... I think the ranking is in the name. I think it's a. I think it's a C for me. I think that it is. It's good, uh, as you said. They're going to be necessary and critical in certain aspects, but as you also said, you need a seafarer to to move your stuff. And I think it's just going to be kind of like the other ones that we talked about. Some of them are going to make a ton of money. Some of them are going to be really, really far into the game and only focus on moving big ships and, and whatnot and making a killing doing that. But I, I don't think that all of them are going to have boats. I, I could almost see it being a, a high D because not everyone's going to have a boat. With the number of boats and the number versus the number of seafarers, you're, you're kind of supply and demand isn't really uh, that great there. So what are your thoughts on that, Grill? Um, yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat. Uh, I had to do it. <laughs> um, they didn't sell out all the boats, um, especially with some of the larger stuff. I also think it might be the single most boring exemplar, especially since they've confirmed that sailing is like click the sail. So what you, you, you sit on the boat and you click and then it just goes from one place to the other. Do you actually play it? Like what skills will Seafarer have? I don't really know. We know Miranda is a... Uh, you know, a series of islands, but how much this is an example that maybe will get better over time. You know, as we discover, as they expand and they discover more areas, because I can tell you a seafarer in the playtest would have been pretty, pretty useless. There's a bunch of, if it's a single island we start on, then maybe it sails around, maybe it sails up a river with a small boat. Uh, I can see early on them being pretty weak with them scaling well as the game expands. I, I don't see how you actually play this exemplar. Without some kind of sailing mini game, or you, know, you actually you drive the boat or something, so I think they'll be good. I think they'll be better later on. I also think they're going to be incredibly boring, at least uh, with information that we have at this point. Again, with, you know, once again, maybe the uh, the Miranda's team can enlighten us on some on their thoughts and the knowledge that they have about these classes. So I've actually put a little bit of thought into these guys because, for instance, RuneScape, it's been around forever and it, they are just now starting to work on sea, explore, uh, sea exploration within the game. So like you'll be able to actually move around the boat, I think. I don't know. But I know that that game's been around for forever and they've done tons of updates and it's just now coming to the game. So I don't think and I know that actually McCarthy's confirmed that we're not going to be able to drive the boats around in Miranda's. That's going to be way too heavy of a mechanic and whatnot. I could see this being more of a, a gambling situation. So based on your abilities, your levels, your masteries, you have different chances to find different things when you go out exploring to the sea. And every time you go out exploring, maybe it costs a certain amount of resources. So a possibility, and maybe like there's a 10% a chance you find another island, or uh, maybe there's a 5% chance you encounter some sort of rare treasure in the sea I, I i don't know i'm just kind of throwing stuff out there but if that's the case then again some of these guys could make a bunch of money but not everybody's going to make a bunch of money because not everybody's gonna have a boat it almost feels like staking with them you stick them on a boat and make some passive income and that's it that would actually boost their value right if it's a low time exemplar where you can just kind of stake it in a ship and yeah it'd be, it'd be good so I, I would put them high D tier. I'm happy with that. It. Okay. I think they're probably around the same level as the photographer. I think uh, better, but yeah. Yeah, a little better because I think they scale better into as the game gets bigger, where the photographers do the opposite. All right. Up next, we have the jack of all trades, the strong hands. The exemplar with the most utility, arguably. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be one of the hottest, I mean, it can kind of do everything, uh, again, not as specialized as some of the ex other exemplars, but somebody wants to kind of just do a variety of things, probably the best exemplar, you know, in terms of crafting. So yeah, I would probably put it a uh, high C hammer. I can see that. Um, these guys are just the handyman of Miranda's <laughs> essentially. They're 
uh, expediency trait is just bonus to all crafting. That's what it says. So I think these pretty straightforward. Now, what's actually maybe not so much. So what is what is crafting? How is that different from maybe going to an anvil and, and doing that? Or uh, how is that different from like a green cloak? What's what's crafting? Well, my guess would be it can do everything, but their buffs are not going to be as significant as a goldsmith for jewelry or a true provider. I don't know. I mean, what's your opinion, Grill? Jack of all trades, master of none. Um, like you said, very high utility as they can fill in holes uh, in any building. Uh, there's also a few buildings that don't have specific exemplars, such as Stonecraft. So they will be the main crafter for those buildings as well. I think they'll probably be running like the Green Cloaks 24-7 in high demand simply for the reason that, oh, you know, we're short here. We don't have this exemplar. Send a strong hand and get some kind of bonus, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think they're pretty good. Uh, I do generally like specialists. I think specialists are always better than generalists uh, for that reason that they're a little weaker than all the other crafting classes. I do think they'll be in quite high demand come game time, especially when the, the game is really pumping. But I, I would put these, like... Behind the green cloaks, I'd put them as probably like the worst like crafting focus exemplar. Simply because specialists just tend to be better. I would agree with that. I'd say uh, I'd put them yeah. at C. Okay. All right. Up next, the weavers. Well, I'm going to cue you up, Grill, because again, you and Alum have schooled me on the value of cloth in MMORPGs. So. <laughs> Why don't you school the listeners on how <laughs> bullish you guys are on cloth? Cloth in almost every MMO I've ever played winds up usually being the very best and rarest and powerful armor sets because they are generally used by spell casters or wizards or warlocks or whatever you want to call them. And they tend to be, they generally are the most powerful damage classes in the game. And you can even see that here in Miranda's where... The elves, a couple of them, are focused all around bonuses to spells. So they will be looking for the very best, you know, the highest tier of exemplar is going to be looking for cloth armor. At least a couple of them will be. Possibly more than a couple of them. There's also cloth can be used across, kind of like wood, where it's going to be used probably in almost almost every single building in terms of upgrades or components for other recipes. You know, just because maybe something's that leather armor or mail or plate armor well there might be a cloth component to that so they'll be used for that as well possibly again for ships my mmo experiences show me that cloth winds up being incredibly profitable and incredibly powerful and incredibly high demand usually right from the beginning of an expansion or a game to the very end it never seems to uh that need for cloth never seems to wane at all where would you place it probably somewhere maybe above the green cloak or below the gold uh the goldsmith i, I think weaver is going to be pretty powerful and outfitters like the goldsmith and the alchemist are rare buildings too, right? Same thing. There's only 10 of the large outfit. Actually, there's only one large outfit, right? That got no dropped. I haven't even sold them in the store. But they're the same class of buildings as the potions and jewelers. So pro probably below the goldsmith. I, th I think it belongs kind of in that grouping with the, with the other two. Henry, got thoughts? Yeah, sorry. Give me just one second. I'm uh, I'm on open sea picking up a weaver right now. <laughs> no, no uh, that was that was a very good speech on why um, weavers are undervalued because you had very good points. I see what virtual meant because you're right in Elder Scrolls Online, which is a game that I played quite a bit of. It's a, it's another MMO. The most expensive gear was often the spellcaster gear which was the light armor and it was expensive because it, it had magical abilities to it increased your damage yada 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 and i think that a lot of people coming into mmos in general just everybody wants to be a dps everyone wants to do damage so that's probably going to be the most common armor type yeah no i could totally see these guys being a very good exemplar to have even beyond spellcrafter let's say exemplar that's coming up next with the true providers you know maybe they wear well, that would make sense, right? You know, I don't see somebody tilling the fields in a full state of plate armor. They can make clothing for crafting exemplars that provides bonuses to crafting or farming or potion making or whatever else. So it doesn't necessarily have to be spellcaster gear that they're making. It could also be enhanced gear for other exemplars as well that are not out adventuring. Wow, yeah. Um, I feel like I'm kind of on too much of a hype train right now. I, I want to say B because I'm on the hype train, but 
I, I I think realistically, it's probably a C right beside Green Cloak either way, in, in my opinion. Virtual, what are your thoughts? Cool either way. I'm cool with either high C or lower B. So, uh, Grill, you, you, you're you the final call. I'm going to put him with the other one. It just makes sense because these are the three exemplars that work at the rare buildings. And Weaver wow. could even potentially be higher than, honestly, than Goldsmith, honestly. I would actually put it here. I'm happy with I, it. I, yeah, I think the Weavers are going to be very popular in high demand. Yeah, well, I need the crafting. Right, this game is there's a lot of crafting in this game, right? I say that about a lot of them because there's going to be a lot of items that need to be produced for this game to run. So, uh, and the ones that work at rare at the rare buildings, I think, will be even higher demand. Okay, up next, a mom favorite, the true provider. Yeah, this is the exemplar that we own the most. We, as of this recording, own twenty four point six percent. Of, of all the true providers that's why i mean for mom this this is s tier uh yeah. but let's you know put ourselves in the shoe of maybe someone who's not in mom yeah i, I think it's going to be an incredibly high demand exemplar uh, obviously food's going to be essential to the game so i would put it b tier uh probably below the alchemist i think it's going to be a very high demand in general Probably no shortage of food to be harvested, but uh, for mom is S tier. Hammer, you know, I I think this one might scratch the first A that I give out, and that's because everyone has to eat food, and they have to eat food a lot, and these guys are going to be the ones that. Have, so the ability description of these guys is bonus to all farming and ranching abilities, so that would include obviously like crops and and animals so it goes both ways and it's a consumable that every single player must have uh now not every one of these guys is going to be able to have a farm that they're going to be able to tend to though i think that this is an absolute necessity for every single character inside the game so i i think i might throw this one at an a okay so it looks like i'm gonna be a little bit of a counterpoint here i think it really depends on how they balance things. So there's only 5,000 people in the game and the farms produce a lot of food, then you're not going to need a lot of troop providers because there's going to be overabundance. Now, if they make it so the amount of materials being produced by all the farming plots in the game scale with the kind of the active player base of the game. So if there's a low amount of people, well, the output of the farms are really low and then all the farms will have to run and all the troop providers will be busy. Say there's 50,000, there's a max, you know, the game has still got a waiting list to get in. Well, now the farms produce more in the same kind of balance of ratio. And it'll be the same thing. All the true providers will be busy and necessary. But if the balancing is not like that, you can have a situation where the farms are overproducing and you won't have as much need to... So remember, they're going to be making cotton for weavers. It's not just food, right? Flax, cotton, linen. Um, they'll also be doing all the ranching. And, you know, that could be wool... Doesn't have to be food either, right? Wool or leather, right? You, know, you can skin a cow and get leather. So I, I do think they are quite powerful, especially since food. You play any MMO or any RPG or ARPG, whatever, and you know, you're, you're chugging food constantly. Food and potions seem to be the things that you use the most of. I worry a little about the scaling, but that's really just about balance, right? They can balance the game out. So the land deeds are running at a capacity the whole time. I think, uh, you know, I want to take my rose colored glasses off here and. Place them, like, maybe behind the big three? I don't know. I guess they could be above the big three. It really it really all depends. I want to add something. You said tannery, or you, you mentioned something about skinning animals. Well, yeah. that they could be the, the tannery exemplars, and there's really not a lot of the tanneries either, so these guys could have that bonus on top of crops and, and other animal. They could abilities. be, yeah. There's no specific exemplar, so it's either going to be them or the strong hands would probably make the most sense, right? For tanneries, they could have very high utility. It all depends on how they design things, the balancing. Like I said, I want to take off my rose colored glasses because obviously, to me, you know, they're, you can just put them straight here. Like they're by far the most important example for what we're trying to do in the game. Among the entire game, I think somewhere in this B tier. What do you guys feel like? I'm, I'm a little indifferent or undecided. You think high B above the, the, the big three or behind them? Uh, I would, I would put it probably below 
the alchemist. And kind of mix like a sandwich in the middle here? Yeah, no, I, I think that I would be okay with that. I would I would personally say above B, or I'm sorry, above Alchemist, but just because every single exemplar within the game is going to need food at some point, I mean, just about daily. But then again, you know, Alchemists, they're, they're a super powerful exemplar, and in-game Alchemists are going to make an absolute killing. Now, again, with the, the, the true providers, if you have the farm ground like if it, say you have a farming hamlet those guys are going to be super super powerful or if you have something yeah. even bigger they're going to be super powerful but yeah that's all what's the word i want to say substantial not not substantial but like s- subjective we'll say maybe uh we'll get some information about exemplars more information uh with one of these upcoming amas and uh maybe hopefully make us look silly on some of these choices <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I love that our building AMA forced them to show their hand a little bit. So hopefully we'll see that with the exemplars. Yeah, exactly. All right. So through the humans, and we're now moving up in the world to the orcs. The first one being the orcs of the beating heart. And the humans only took an Before hour. We get... <laughs> <laughs> this might be, it's on track to be the longest video in mom history. Question you know, before we get into ranking the orcs, where would you place just the orcs in general, you know, as far as tiers? Because obviously for adventurers, it's, I guess, the best entry class. Arguably, you could use humans, but yeah, I'm curious. Again, we'll, we'll obviously rank them, but curious, where would you guys rank orcs amongst the five levels? Real Without a lot of deep discussion into it, probably like a B tier. They'll have improved stats. They'll be capable of going out in the wild. And that alone has some value just because that is a lot of people's preferred play style. Not everyone wants to sit in town there and grow corn all day or chop wood or make arrows or something like that. It's just, people want to go out there and, and kill stuff, right? You know, there's always that kind of excitement that comes along with killing something in a game and like, oh, what does it have? Well, you loot it and like, what does it have? have something special? Did I get something amazing today? So that alone gives it a little more value than the humans. I also think as a group, and the same thing with the dwarves, that the group, since they all seem to have different components of the what you need to be an adventurer, I think as a group of orcs working together is would elevate them. Just like a group of dwarves having all the different kind of components of what you need to mine elevates them to a higher level. Uh, on an individual level, though, probably somewhere you know in that B tier. Uh, maybe below the... Good humans for some of them, maybe above for others, depending on what that specific ability is. Hammer? I'd almost put them at C, just because they're great adventurer classes, but there are typically other exemplars that can beat them in what they do. So The problem is elves exist. Right, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's what I'm thinking. Here's a hot take. If the rental market takes off, I think orcs, like I so see you, you'd buy an orc today, could have one of the highest ROIs. And I'm saying that because hey, if you're a new player and you want to just try Mirandus out, and let's say the elves, I don't know what the price is going to be, but let's say it's three times or four times or five times more expensive than an orc, what are you going to rent? Are you going to just roll the dice and roll and rent an elf, or are you going to rent an orc? I think most most players would rent an orc i I wouldn't be surprised if the orcs are the most rented characters if again the rental market has a lot of demand because i don't see a lot of people renting humans and crafting i mean yeah that could happen if the if there's enough money to be made people will do anything (laughs) that's right but but i think most players the the masses are going to want to play mirandis as as you said grill to go adventure, to go kill things. And this is really the entry class for that. So for that reason, I would put it uh, B class in general, but again, some will probably be C and some will be high B. So any thoughts on that? I almost see them as being kind of like a field farming class. Yeah, they won't get to do the super high tier crazy stuff that the elves. The elves are like the big game hunters. These guys are going to be out there farming like low level mobs, bringing back mess mats for crafting. So they're similar in a way that like a green cloak is a gatherer, right? These guys will be gatherers and they will get some low level treasure, potentially some high level stuff. 
we'll have the opportunity to run across you know some of the world's like secrets and puzzles and maybe you know specifically these guys can see heat signatures right so maybe you need them for certain things there's the whole something we haven't really discussed is like group dynamics and raid dynamics and what is needed for a raid to be successful well Maybe you can't do that raid unless you have a beating heart orc in your group to see this heat signature. Or you need a green cloak to cut down a rare tree that you cut through high-level mobs for the last hour to get to these rare resources. It's something we haven't discussed um, much in this video. We have discussed in the past a bit. I see these kind of being the world gatherers and farmers. Tanking, I mean, just to wrap up on this and we'll get into the ranking that, but Grill, talk about tanking because that's the role you play in a lot of games. I mean, aren't the orcs going to be the tanks maybe could also potentially be an elf you know if elves just have the best stats right then one of them is maybe better at melee or tanking or is tougher but you know that can be for maybe for high level stuff or maybe they can go out and soul a bunch of stuff as like a high level tank which is what you can do in a lot of games for to a group of orcs yeah i, I imagine group of low level adventures i imagine you'll see some some orcs doing some tanking for sure i you know they could be the tanks for everything outside of really large groups or they could be off tanks you usually have a main tank that will or a couple of main tanks that will um focus on the biggest baddest enemy but let's say that big bad enemy summons a swarm of ads well you need a group of other tanks to deal with that so maybe that could be the orcs you know maybe they're not main tanks maybe they're they're off tanks um of course that could be completely wrong and they just have the best tanking stats and they wind up being the best tanks in the game I don't quite see that, considering that there was exemplars that were 10 times their price uh, available that, that are definitely going to be the best uh, world adventurers and fighters. But it's possible. It's definitely possible. All right, let's get into it. Their ability is to see heat signatures. And like I said, it's um, at this point in time, it's pretty vague. And that kind of goes for all the orcs seem very vague. Maybe that's really powerful. Maybe it's not. I'm not really sure. Maybe it allows you, maybe heat signatures allow you to see things that are hidden maybe they're invisible but they can see them right with like their infrared vision maybe they could see critical strike points on enemies like weaknesses and armor it's really hard to say exactly what that utility is without more knowledge one of the weaker orcs i think that again if it's like predator and you can see some some silhouettes of things at night it could be really cool yeah. but yeah to me I think if you've got a dark sun, if you've got a lantern, I mean, maybe if you see things from really far, that could really provide maybe more more visibility than just the lantern or the dark suns. But yeah, in general, I would put them on the lower side of the uh, orcs hammer. I would definitely agree with that. I'd put them in, I think there's, there's five orcs, I think. I'd probably yeah. put them at number four or number five. I think that this could be a d tier but just because it's an orc i'd want to say a c tier just because it, the ability to see heat signatures is great but i i think that he's just going to be really good at hunting and that's about it could make a good scout for a um for a raiding party but i almost think that yeah i don't know I, i'm not a big fan i think what we know about them at this point and the limited potentially the very limited or very specific utility that they have yeah I, I agree that like i'd probably put them under the strong hands i'm good with that Yep. Okay. Okay. Up next, we have the Bone Orcs. I think it's arguable and we can debate it, but I would say either the Bone Orcs or Orcs of the Long Hunt are the top tier. I mean, if we're talking about tanking, I mean, their special specialty is proved mending, faster healing, uh, almost immune to bleeding. So they're probably going to be one of the toughest Orcs. So I, I would definitely put it uh, B tier. Hammer. Yep, I would completely agree. I think this is orc number one, and I think that this one has a potential to be an A or potentially S tier, in my opinion. Because if elves, if elves are not good tanks, this is going to be the the tank for the game. Um, you know, there's a potential for the bright sun elf to be a tank, but we don't really we don't really know about that. Uh, this guy, his ability. Uh, improved mending it gives faster healing and almost immune to bleeding i think that this guy is i'd give him an a just because i i think that he could be the best tank in the game as you kind of talked about it's it, we don't really know what's going on yet but yeah that's where i throw him they're also immune to bleeding which we don't know how prevalent that'll be in game two or almost immune yeah they have the clearest utility of all the orcs 
Uh, other than the, the clear bud, which is, you know, it's good with poison. I don't know if you can any clearer than that. We don't know how prevalent poison will be. But, um, yeah, they're the most straightforward. They have the clearest amount of utility. It's kind of a little easy to extrapolate what they're going to be in game. I just definitely, they definitely feel like this is going to be the tank class of the lower tier characters. Yeah, I would put them probably top of the B tier with what's currently there. Probably the highest ranked thing we've run across so far. I'm quite, I'm good with that. Yep. Okay. Yeah, sounds good to me. Yeah. I don't think I think A tier is in reserve for. I think these A and S tiers are in reserve for things that are like really special. Special. <laughs> this is you know there's two thousand orcs right of each type, so they're still a little too common. For me to really put them up in those top two tiers, there's two thousand of each. Dang. Okay. There's twenty five hundred of each human. I think there's two thousand of each orc, a thousand of each uh, halfling, and two hundred of each elf. If I if I remember correctly. Yeah. Anyway. There's eight hundred of each halfling and okay. two hundred, two hundred of each elf. Yeah. Corrected. All right. Well, up next we have the clear blood. The hammer will kick us off here. So. Okay, you guys are, you know quite a bit more than I do as far as we could say the politics of um, wallets go. But this one, I believe, Benefactor owns the most of. Is that correct? He bought like a hundred of them and cleared out the, like a whole tier or the last of a tier, um, which yeah. might have been the final tier. Yeah, he, he, he picked up a whole bunch of those. And see, that's so. so interesting to me because this one sounds lame i mean it's it's cool in the sense that i mean you're immune to poisons but that's so specific yeah it's really specific <laughs> there's so many monsters you could fight that just don't have poison so i would think to put this one d tier but the fact that benefactor bought so many of them is is really interesting to me so i want to hear what you guys have to say i think it's one of these exemplars that's s tier in poisonous situations <laughs> and D, D tier the rest of the time. I think for players that want to buy, say, multiple exemplars, I think owning one's a smart move. And then you pull it out when you're going to poisonous areas because if they make poison really poisonous, it might literally be the only exemplar that can go into certain areas and those mm -hmm. areas might be really valuable. So again, it's going to be S or D depending on what situation you're in. Go ahead, Grill. We know that the bone orcs are nearly immune to bleeding, and these guys are nearly immune to poison. And I'm pretty sure there's going to be some kind of elemental debuffs, you know, like a fire dot or maybe some kind of freeze debuff that slows you. So if there's only a certain amount of debuffs and a lot of enemies apply poison, and it's very prevalent, then these these exemplars start to become quite strong. They could also be a tanking class for say 25% of the. Mobs in the game apply poison. Well, all of a sudden, these guys become incredibly useful. So it's really based on game design. At the moment, without any other game knowledge, they seem incredibly weak, but they could easily be be quite strong. Every bit as good as the Bone Orc. If the Bone Orc is the bleed tank, maybe these guys are the poison tank. So it's, it's hard to say. The only thing is the Bone Orcs heal, and these don't, but maybe they can have an ability. It's like for every stack of poison, they heal X amount. So now they're negating the poison, but now the poison actually becomes like a healing buff to them. It's a... Kind of something I was thinking about. A little interesting maybe piece of game design or something in combat. So yeah, I, I would put them probably in C tier. I would put them above the beating heart for now. Mm -hmm. This could easily move quite far up the list depending on further information releases. I'm good with that. My last comment is, I mean, from a game design perspective, if you're listening, Jason and Michael, <laughs> creating areas that essentially creates the need for things like clear bloods to be the only viable option really makes the game interesting, creates a lot of utility. A team would have to bring a clear blood to let's say get pushed into a poisonous swamp or whatever. So I really hope from a game design perspective that they do that. Yeah, one last thing. So I just wanted to remind everybody that uh, again, healing in game, it, well, from the play test was by eating food or no, I'm sorry, it was, it was sleeping at a tent. And so the faster healing is a, that is a little bit confusing, right? Because faster healing, you would typically in games, you know, you heal over time. But in Miranda's, it doesn't seem like that's going to be a thing. Am I am I missing something actually? It's all about the bone orcs. Yeah, sorry, I'm going back to the bone orcs for a second, and I was going to tie that to the clear board. Oh, so this quick to heal and almost entirely immune to bleeding. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly how it'll work. Maybe they just receive more healing from healing spells. That's how they make it quote unquote quick. So yeah, it's hard to say. 
Gotcha. Well, and the reason I brought that up is because you mentioned the clear bloods could be the the tank for um for poison, poison dots and and then the bone work is for bleeding. So maybe that's the case, and maybe actually I overvalued the bone works because the healing it's in the play test anyway was only done via sleeping. So um, yeah. yeah, just kind of interesting. That's yeah. a good point. The play test you. was very the play test is very limited in terms of mechanics too, right? I mean, you weren't sleeping in that. You were clicking on that tent, and usually quite often. Good point, yeah. (laughs) Well, one one more potential strong use case for the clear blood is going to be if there's a lot of poisonous creatures. So, again, there there could be certain creatures that you're only shot at not getting destroyed as clear bloods. Yeah, exactly. So, depending on what, you know, how they design the game, they could be bottom of the D tier to all the way up in S tier or A tier someplace, in my opinion. But for now, with the knowledge we currently have, I, I think they basically belong like like right here. Dig it. Yep, I like it. Yeah. The Orc of Certainty is up next. I think this is probably the worst. <laughs> I, I mean, to me, it's worse than the beating heart. Uh, sensing aggression and fear... The beating heart sounds more interesting visually, right? I mean, we're going to see silhouettes and hopefully like in predator style visuals, but yeah, sensing fear, I, I have no idea. One thing they did talk about in the recent AMA was, and, and I think this was suggested in the Discord channel and the, the team seemed to like it, is if it can actually kind of hear danger before you go to another zone. I, by the way, I hate the idea of getting an alert of moving into a zone and it tells you if it's going to be dangerous or not. To me, this really uh, takes a lot of the adrenaline out of the game. So, but I'm cool with it and it would provide good utility to orcs of certainty if that was their superpower. But other than that, uh, probably the worst one. Hammer? Yeah, actually, I think I take back what I said previously because at least the uh, with these guys being the second worst, because at least with the other orcs, they could... They could hunt with these guys. They're really just kind of confined to be in a scout role. I mean, it's nice to be able to see aggressive creatures, maybe taking them into a cave with you and notifying the dwarves that are mining <laughs> when something's coming. But like, I, I don't know. When death is coming. <laughs> Impending doom. Run. These guys. Yeah, they pretty much just have one use case. And I'd throw them at D personally. The uh, obvious utility to these is quite uncertain. You know, sense aggressive, does that mean they can see an elite mob within a pack of mobs? And do they do anything else? It's really hard to say what the utility of that actually is. They seem very, 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 very specialized. Maybe they get bonuses against aggressive creatures. Something they could do to add a little more utility and make them a little better. But at the what we currently know, they just seem not very strong. I would place them probably top of the D tier. Yeah, I would agree with that just thought of something so the one use case that i could see with these guys is maybe you could and this kind of takes away from the game a little bit but if you could see some sort of radius of the aggressive creatures aggro that could be interesting that would yeah. add a whole new um, level to their ability and usefulness like i think you'd want one in every party but like just because you want to cover all the bases right that goes wrong on any example though yeah, that's not something unique to them, but right. I don't see I don't see why you'd want like more than one, right? For sure. Yeah, you know, in a WoW raid, right? You you usually try to cover utility, then you just stack it with the best classes. No one's stacking works of certainty, at least you know what we know currently. So I, I chuck think it. they're chuck e. it up there. Boo. <laughs> nah. Yeah, I, I think that's a pretty good place for it. It could almost even be lower, honestly. Like just. I would agree with that. It's, it's, it seems specific, but we'll leave it there for now just because it's an epic. Just one quick comment on all the orcs. I mean, again, assuming that they have all the bit most again, good basic stats and I predict they're going to have a very high health level, then, you know, they're all going to have good utility for raiding, adventuring, tanking. But yeah, I, I think the last one is arguably the best one, so we can debate that. But the specialty of the orcs of the long hunt is the thrill of these hunts sustain them more than sleep. So they can go longer without food and sleep. And we saw in the last play test how critical stamina was. So I think they're going to have a big stamina buff. Maybe they don't use as much stamina. And the fact that 
we're going to be pushing into deep territory, into the dark, deep, unknown waters of Mirandus, I I would probably put it above the bone orcs myself. So, hammer. Wow, that's a that's a hefty rating. This was actually fun fact. This was my very first Mirandus um, buy ever. And that's because I watched a video uh, by somebody else, and I can't remember who it was at this time. Uh, but they were talking about how this was one of the most underrated exemplars. And I was like, yeah, you know what? You're right. It, that, that is a good exemplar. And they really are. The fact that they can go longer without food or sleep is is a huge deal because that means less money spent on food and potentially less money spent sleeping as well. So they're going to be potentially more um, economically friendly to a certain degree, maybe not a ton. I think that the the most benefit you kind of hit on the head would be just them being able to be out longer and um, maybe go a little bit deeper than most other exemplars could. As uh, as farmers and food producers, hopefully no one plays them. Yeah, nobody think, buy these. Uh, F2. Yeah, exactly. Worse, they're not even they're not even gonna get placed. I'm just gonna leave them in the bottom. I agree. I think they're, you know, I, I think it comes a lot down to the how clear and obvious the utility is. Where it's a lot clearer with these. Okay, they can go out and they can hunt longer. And they'll be cheaper to run, so they could have better ROI potentially than the other orcs. And that alone is going to make us place them higher now. Will they have improved combat stats too? I'm not sure. But on paper, they seem like the strongest of the orcs for generally the thing that people want to do with the orcs, which is go out and kill things. I, I think I put these above the bone orc as well. I don't think they're quite A tier, but I think they'll be the ones that'll be the. I think they'll be the most popular outside of the whatever one winds up being the best tank. Because people like the tank, too. I think I'm happy with that. Cool. And as Virtual mentioned, uh, these guys being super rentable, this guy would make a ton of sense. Yep. They're going to be probably the most desirable to go out with of the orcs, and they'll be the cheapest to run. I think that's a clear win right there. All right. We are done with the orcs. We are now moving on to their shorter purple brothers, the dwarves. So this is the mining class, and the first one is the iron shapers, and... I'm going to come right out of the gate. I'm coming in hot. And I'm going to say this is the first A-tier exemplar. I think that, obviously, weapon crafting is going to be one of the most in-demand utilities. I think everybody's going to want weapons. And if they, if there's, again, mastery has to matter. So if mastery levels influence the level of the weapons, you could see people just crafting weapons like crazy so they become the best iron shapers in Miranda's. Um, so yeah, that's my take. Hammer? Yeah, I'd say either, I, I'd say probably upper B for me uh, because these guys, you could make the same argument for um, some of the well, I don't know. I could I could see him being a low A because you could make the same argument for the big three human exemplars but there's, there's less of this guy than there are the human exemplars. Um, everyone, well, 99% of us are going to be using a weapon. Um, <laughs> so I think that these guys will be in need. Um, one thing that I am a little bit concerned about is weapon inflation. And that's a whole other conversation uh, that could potentially have its own video. But uh, yeah, what are, your, what are your thoughts on them crafting too many weapons? Not going to be an issue if you can smelt down right. the weapons. Yes, and and it, you know, really the thing they have to manage is resource inflation. So is yeah. iron everywhere? Is iron infinite? Then we're going to have major problems. If iron is rare, if it takes a lot of time to to harvest and bring to the towns, then they can control that. So go ahead, grill. If you can smell things down and just get iron back, then that that would be, I think, a bigger issue than the actual item inflation. These guys are going to be running the forges. They're going to be crafting all the metal items in the game. Uh, I think that alone pretty much puts them at A tier. I can't see a scenario where they're not uh, at max demand in, when the game is, uh, you know, got a large player base. Uh, and they'll be crafting some of the top weapons and armor in the game. And not just weapons and armor. They'll be making tools, stuff for buildings. Again, they're going to interact with the buildings with the stuff they're crafting. Yeah, I, I think this is the... Uh, the absolute best of all the crafting uh, exemplars in the game. Where would you put it? I would put it probably bottom of the A tier. I think this is probably going to be the worst A tier exemplar. I'm happy but with it. I also don't think there's going to be a lot of exemplars up in A and S tier. But yeah, I think the, the probably the best dwarf. This might be some arguments for a couple others. The dwarves, the, the dwarves have nice utility and they're also 
you know, they control a base resource in ore in, in general. And people seem to really like them. People are all like hyped up about mining. There's like mining guilds. We have groups of a group of people within mom that are all trying to organize things for mining and stuff like that. So people seem to be pretty hyped about mining. And if there's already a, a few people, that means as the game grows, there'll be more and more people interested to it. The, the, the interest should scale up with the player base. Okay, up next we have the Miranda's Pack Mule, the Conveyors. I think it's arguably the worst dwarf. <clears throat> I don't see a lot of value to carrying extra weight, maybe. I mean, I guess you're going to save time. Depends how deep the caves are. Like, if, if you have to walk a lot and you can't bring the horse in, then it would have more utility. If you can bring your horse in, they have essentially zero utility. And if the caves aren't that deep, then their utility is really minimal. So anyways, I, I, I'd probably put it C tier, low B. I mean, it just depends where mining falls, but uh, yeah, probably the worst one in my opinion. Hammer. Okay, I'm going to come at you here. So in uh, I'm going to use RuneScape as an example. So when I first started playing RuneScape, I was looking for a way to make as much money as I could with the, my amount of time that I had to play the game. And I also didn't have a very high level character and one of the if not the best ways to make money in runescape as a new player is to be something called a runner and a runner is essentially somebody who goes from point a to point b point a being a player who hires you to run materials that they're harvesting to point b and those people actually make quite a bit of money because the the people who hire them are working on um, skilling working up working on leveling up their skills. In this case, it could be masteries. You know, maybe this there's a dwarf out there mining a bunch of gems and he it's more profitable for him to stay at point A than run all the way to point B then back to point A. So I could see these guys actually being really useful in that scenario and, act, and potentially making a good amount of money from that. Because this was, I mean, if we're talking, of course, this is RuneScape and this is a whole different game. But in in a lot of MMOs, these guys can make two to three times what somebody just going around and and killing bosses is. As, at least for a low-level player, anyway. I'm going to be uh, with Hammer on this one. In general, in any game that's limited with inventory and carrying weight, things that can improve that wind up being immensely strong. Like, incredibly, incredibly powerful. There's a lot of places that you're not going to be able to bring horses or carts. And maybe the horses can't carry that much. I know when we're playing Valheim, they were, we would spend hours literally going from point A to point B just hauling stuff. And we couldn't bring a cart uh, or a boat or anything else close by. So we would just have to literally just run it. And one of the biggest changes in that game, there is an item that increases your carrying weight by 50%. That cuts your amount of trips needed and time down by 50%. Now, I don't know how much of a buff the conveyors will have, but my experience in MMOs and survival games and RPGs and whatnot, anything that can make transporting things from one place to another you know, easier and more efficient tends to be very, very, very strong. Uh, my, my personal opinion, I'd probably put them top of the B tier for the conveyors. I, I think they're going to be like one of the most in-demand exemplars in the whole game. Even when you're not out in the field, like let's say you're in town and you need to carry, you know, these towns are big, right? You need to carry a whole bunch of stuff from one side of the town to the other. You might even use a conveyor for something like that if they're in town. I think all the dwarves are B tier, so I'm good with that. Okay. I can see Hammer, this guy. you're good? Yep, I, I'm totally cool with that. I could see this guy yeah. walking around with just an inventory full of stuff, yelling in the chat, like, come get your words here. Walking around as a I'm, store himself. Like, like, they could be good mobile merchants. Right. That's something we haven't discussed much either. Like, you're going to have all these stores, but what's stopping somebody from just rolling up in front of your shop and selling stuff on the cutting your store? Yeah, that's so, huge. Like, like I, a competitor, like, from the next town over. Yep. Sends, uh, sends some guy. Now, I don't think it's the game. I think with how hard it is to get from place to place, it probably won't be cost effective to do that. But there's potential there. Maybe somebody, like, outside of town, like, you know, in a homestead or an outpost or something. As like a crafting station and they're crafting stuff. It's going to be hard to compete. We're going to be getting so many materials. I just don't see how that happens. But you never know. Crazy things have happened and there'll be some incredibly crazy stuff in this game. I think. Every scheme and wacky thing possible uh, in such a um, kind of an open playground as this. 
That's for sure. And before we leave this topic, I, I want to do it a little bit of justice, but I can't dive too deep into it because this would be a long conversation. But <laughs> again, in another game that I played in um, Elder Scrolls Online, that's what I did all the time. I didn't sell goods at a shop because there that was taxed. Instead, I would just post in the, in the game chat and I would sell so much doing that now of course you know there are some people that are really annoying with it but you can also find like really good connections doing that and i that's how i made all of my money and i did really really well in that game um just by zone selling but mccarthy doesn't seem to be too concerned about zone selling so i'm i'm interested to see how that'll actually turn out uh, it, it seems like mccarthy wants to s- some level of chaos <laughs> and and randomness right right yeah it seems it seems like he gets excited whenever he whenever he thinks about things getting like completely skewed in one direction or another i, I think he wants to see players take the game to the extreme which which we will <laughs> if, you're, if you're into extreme domination join us uh, beautiful all right plug. next one <laughs> all right so next is the glimmering clan which kind of these next three are very closely tied together in my opinion since they all are kind of the orcs, or orcs, the dwarves that control the mining of ore. So let's read the description here, the because description has me asking a lot of questions, as most gala descriptions do. <laughs> These dwarves can sense valuable ore and gems in what some would discard as rubble, and their ability is a bonus to mining output. Which is a little bit contradictory. I mean, so the thing that's the most intriguing to me in that description is gems. Now, the question is, can other dwarves find gems? I'm assuming they can. Can the Glimmering Clan find more gems? Can they find more valuable gems? And if they can, and again, we're really bullish on gems because we're assuming that gems can be enchanted, put into weapons, put into other things they could be the most valuable dwarf other than the iron shaper so they could be a tier but again we're in the dark because it just sounds like they're going to get a bonus to mining output but definitely i would put it the second highest dwarf regardless because even if it's just pure uh, mining output the value of that's going to be incredible hammer i think it's objectively (laughs) an a tier uh and that's I think you kind of hit the nail on the head there. It's got a bonus to mining output, and that directly contributes to so much inside of the game, so much the economy. That's also going to be a really, really great way, regardless of how many of these guys there are, to go out and make money. I mean, it's kind of like the uh, Green Cloaks. You can just straight up, you can have one of these guys and just go mine and make money. Sometimes it'll be a ton. You might find some really rare gems. Sometimes it might not be a ton, but like you can, there's a straightforward path to to make money so i like these guys i think they're an a i I think they're pretty strong i agree pretty much with you guys said it's really hard to say exactly what that means you know did they like go through the rubble pile and further extract i don't know if extract is the right word but just making it so your overall mining operation is more efficient or more profitable then they could be really strong did they have a higher chance of finding gems without more information like you're saying virtual it's really hard to pinpoint exactly how how good they'll be, but on the surface they still seem like they're gonna be quite strong. I would probably put them right above the conveyors, even though in the heart the conveyor might be more in demand. I, I think these guys that the, the potential profitability of them displaces them higher. We outvoted you on that one and we're Hammer and I are both on A on that one. So okay. Yes. <laughs> All right. Denied. Um. Yeah. One last thing on these guys. When I think of the Glimmering Clan, I always think of if you've played Minecraft, I, I, I'm just relating everything to other games and I apologize, but <laughs> I think of Minecraft and I think of a Fortune 3 pickaxe. A Fortune 3 pickaxe can multiply the number of a certain mineable item by one to four. Whereas if you had a normal pickaxe, you might get one or you will get one. This Fortune pickaxe might get Two might get three, might get four. So I could see that being the case with these guys. If they're mining a gem, they might get two of the gem, or they might get four of the gem, or something like that, which would increase your mining output and be very, very valuable if you're into mining. All right, next. Yeah, up next we have the uh, the Deep Mountain Clan. I would say one of the worst dwarves, so they can see in pitch black interiors. 
one, I think torches are going to be a thing. I'm assuming the Lantern of the Sun is going to work in mines. Potentially Dark Sun seen mines. Maybe they don't. But the fact that we're going to have torches, to me, really diminishes their value. I would probably put it um, below the conveyors. Hammer? Yeah, see, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for the elf talk because I'm not a big fan of the exemplars that see in the dark. I think that that's what lanterns are for and that's what torches are for. And yeah, you can maybe hold a two-handed weapon, whereas uh, if you're holding a lantern, you can only use a one-handed. I don't know. But I, I'm not a big fan of these guys. I think that they're a C. I feel like you're going to want one in every mining party, but it's kind of similar to one of the orcs we discussed where like, oh yeah, you want one of these, but you don't really feel the need to stack them, right? Where you could obviously stack hollowers and glimmering clans and conveyors out in the field to increase output. These guys don't seem like they increase the efficiency of mining in any way, shape or form, though they will be essential to the mining team itself. You know, maybe you want a couple because maybe it's a big, a big mine and there's a couple of groups within the mine, but again... It's only one per group, no matter what, where you could just run multiples of the other ones and then produce a lot of ore. Maybe they have the ability to see, I don't know, something different in there, something rare, doors. or I, I'm with you. I don't see a reason why these should be placed. This is definitely the worst dwarf. I think it's quite a bit worse than the other ones. I would, th- I would say maybe bottom of the B tier, maybe even lower, maybe even top of the C tier. Yeah, I think all the dwarves are B, though. You know what I mean? I think... If they're going to get some sort of mining buff, uh, which I'm assuming all of them will, uh, mining is just going to be such a big part of the game. So we're going to the bottom of B, though. Yeah, maybe they're the only ones that can mine. In the, maybe there's like a magical, you know, like a curse in a mine where you, you can't see and only the Deep Mountain Clan can mine those areas, right? That could give them quite a bit of increased utility and value. But we don't have that information yet, so it's just all just guesswork at this point, so... We can put them bottom of the B tier. One last thing on these guys. You'd mentioned them being in a big party, but I don't know how much use they would have in a big party because in a big party, you're going to have lanterns. You're going to have torches, which is going to kind of eliminate the need for this guy. So maybe this guy can scout ahead, can look down maybe smaller paths to find. Maybe the torches don't work inside the dungeons. Right? There's like a magical... Mm. It's hard. It's really hard to say. And that, I mean, again, that's also like every mind can't be magical. It'd be not very magical. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> um, for sure. So again, that once again, kind of limits the obvious, the more obvious scopes of their utility. So, right. Yeah. I, I think this is a good place for now. Things could change as always. Uh, but they, they seem pretty you know, low B high C for me. Last but not least, we have the Hollowers. But I love your voice when you introduce exemplars. This is the weirdest one to me. Feel for fractures. It's essentially the orc of the long hunts of dwarves. So there's going to be value. So again, reduce energy costs when mining. So I guess you're going to be able to go out longer and mine longer and go have less need to go back to, into town. So yeah, I, th- I think the utility is, is solid. Probably put it... Somewhere in the middle of the B tier. There's less trips into town, more time mining, more profitable. Hammer? Yeah, I like these guys. I like mining. The reduced energy cost when mining is very straightforward. That just means that you're going to be able to mine longer. So I I would agree. Probably mid B for me. They're like the workhorse, the actual engine of the the dwarf team, right? They're going to be doing the bulk of the mining. Uh, I think that kind of makes them almost like the green cloak for ore. I think they'll probably be the one in the highest demand, along with the Glimmering. Those two seem to be the actual miners uh, versus the um, the other three. So I would probably place it maybe not as high as the Glimmering, but just right behind it. I don't see what makes it much worse than the than the uh, the Glimmering Clan Orcs. Oh, Dwarfs, sorry. So something a little that I've I've thought of previously is a team of Hollowers and of Glimmering Clans working together. And that hollowers do, as you said, a majority of the digging, but then they leave the glimmering clans to mine up the uh, valuable assets. That way you can, I mean, you're splitting the profits obviously between the two, but you'll be able to get as much out of a trip as you possibly can. So that would be a dangerous combo. Yeah, I think that's probably how it's, you know, at least based on what we know, that's probably how it's going to work. The, uh, the, how... the, the conveyor, right? 
Yeah, so could be right. right for the. Yeah, trail. that's that's like the mining team, right? So you have the deep mountain that's making sure you can see things or scouting things. The hauler will dig in and and mine. The um, glimmering clan will kind of go through the rubble, and then the conveyor will move everything out. And then the iron shaper creates weapons. Yeah, I, I see these guys pretty much just being right behind the glimmering clan. They they do they're they're part of the same pair. Mm-hmm. You know, or they're part of that pair that, that kind of works together to get things done. All right. So we're on to the next tier exemplars here, on to the halflings. And the first one, if I can read that correctly, looks like the long songs. I mean, first of all, I think they're the most, potentially the most intriguing exemplar. So just, just so we get everybody caught up, if you're not familiar with them, they have the alacrity of sound hopefully i said that correctly they have reduced energy costs when playing music and they're able to weave magic through sound so in a lot of ways they're the first magical exemplar i think obviously elves will have more power than them but yeah first of all it sounds awesome they're going to be able to play music hopefully you know, I'm really hoping people can create songs within inside Miranda's using medieval instruments and make them into an NFT. And then they can play that song in a fight and weave magic. So I don't know. They're really intriguing to me. Uh, yeah, I'm very curious. So, yeah, I think probably A tier for me. Hammer. These guys are so hard because there's there's hardly anything to go off of. Um, you know, there's only 800 halflings. But that, that's about it. I mean, we've got reduced energy cost when playing music, but what does that mean? I'm assuming you can, you know, cast different buffs, kind of like you said, but what degree the buffs are, we don't really know. So it's, these guys are hard, but they're really cool. <laughs> and I could also see these guys having their place in a tavern and maybe giving buffs before guys go out for battle or something like that. Maybe recovery music. I don't know. They sound fun. So either A or B for me. These, to me, are probably the best support class, or the only support class, maybe, in the whole game. Uh, and if you've played other RPG-type games, support classes are completely bonkers OP, almost always, because they can buff the stats of so many different people once. The cumulative effect of that winds up being quite large. They're probably the exemplar I would most want to play in a raid, next to maybe a tank. I really, really like support classes in games. Uh, I like having that kind of battlefield control that they offer or the ability to bring a whole party to another level if you really know how to play support well. To me, this would be the first S-tier exemplar. Maybe even better than some of the elves. The only thing I just think the elves, due to cost and rarity, are just going to be too powerful to let them be ahead of them. But uh, I think this is potentially one of the most powerful exemplars in the entire game. One thing I really hope they do from a game design perspective is give the long songs unique magical spells, right? Different than the elves, different buffs than the temple. So that way you can stack all these buffs, right? You go to the temple, you get certain types of buffs. Use the potions, get different types of buffs. Use the long songs, get a different type of buff. And then stack magic on top of that with the elves. The uniqueness of the different types of buffs are really going to provide, again, the the specialization and the utility and the value that's going to make these exemplars valuable. So yeah, I'm, I'm cool with it making it an S tier. Also, it's a kind of a skill expression too. People, are, you know, maybe it's hard to keep your buffs up and there's a tough rotation too. So there's, there's some of that could, you know, it's one of the first examples you talk about where there could be a real expression of skill from the player itself where the actual player will really, really matter. Yeah, I, I'm super excited about playing them. I love support classes. Uh, I, I specifically really like bard type classes. They're always really fun to play. Uh, in Aeon, I played a song weaver for a couple of years, and I had a blast playing it. To me, this is S tier. I, I think it's the best of all the halflings, and possibly one of the best examples of the whole game. You talked me up. I'm happy with it. I think that okay. uh, I think we should have a conversation with the dev team and see if we can't get integration with Guitar Hero guitars. <laughs> That'd be amazing. Rock band set. The medieval version. That's right. Maybe that's how they'll do it. You have to like hit certain keys on your keyboard, and they light up. Right? Wouldn't that be crazy? Uh, probably too graphically intense for the the way they want to do the interface, but that'd be a ton of fun. Uh, I mean, again, I'm a, I'm a musician. I've been playing guitar since I'm 12. It would be it'd be cool if you actually had to kind of 
play the instrument and if you sucked your magic would suck so <laughs> oh, i love it up next we have the never looks you know it's one of these first of all the their superpower is eavesdropping and their abilities fade so they've crouched and motionless you're almost invisible similar to the clear blood i can see maybe certain situations that are going to make this exemplar valuable but to be frank i would throw this in c tier i i think the utility is going to be so minimal i i mean unless again what we don't know is what's the base stats of the halfling class i mean their base stats might be really really strong um better than let's see orcs maybe i don't know but it sounds c tier so and it was between b and c is where i would put it but again there's more questions and answers hammer i think these guys would, could be fun uh but i also don't see like a massive i don't personally have a massive pull to these guys the the almost invisible part could be really really helpful if you find yourself in uh, in a cave and there's some monsters walking by and you can you know just stop for a second and they walk by you and maybe you can get yourself into some some pretty cool places if you do that maybe you could get into mother's cave and and see some cool stuff that maybe you wouldn't be able to otherwise not everyone's going to be able to do that i don't think so i don't know not a huge fan of these guys uh i'd probably put them i'd probably put them b honestly potentially very specific utility yeah they they might have the ability to do things in game that other exemplars can't which is great i, I like that kind of stuff uh i like very specific utility but this is almost like too hyper focused where they don't seem like they'll be useful in situations outside of that in any way shape or form that said you know they're rare and legendary and ha i'm guessing the halflings will have pretty good stats in general so they might still be pretty good regardless just for the fact that they're a halfling but in terms of what they can do specifically yeah i don't i don't see them having on paper they uh they don't seem that great or interesting probably b tier someplace maybe above the humans i don't know maybe above the that that last dwarf there just for the fact that they're a halfling yeah i think like, because they're halfling like here or like here like somewhere in this yeah, range probably above the humans but again if yeah. you're gonna get a halfling right are you gonna get that i don't know yeah i mean i would get almost every other one before that next is the worst <laughs> the even strides yeah, yeah, so. I, I think they're 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 the large armor shop of the exemplar Ooh, tier. Ooh, ouch! That's fighting words. Wow. Yeah, if you don't know what I'm referencing, uh, you're gonna have to watch the building tier video where uh, Grill shreds the large armor and large weapon shops. But I mean, ability to run with less energy. Who cares, right? I mean, how much. I mean, maybe if you're trying to outrun creatures, but I just think the utility of them is absolute garbage compared to every other halfling. It's worse than a never look, in my opinion. So there you go. You see, Grill, it, go ahead. I was going to say that. I, I, want, I want Grill to rant on this. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Grill, you go ahead. So these are kind of the opposite of the last ones where their their utility is very broad. A little more obvious. I actually think for that reason, I would actually place them, consider them to be quite a bit stronger. Yeah, it may, it may seem like, oh, okay, so they just they can run further. But that could be a big thing getting from place. Of, there might be areas that only they can go or maybe, you know, to me, they're like the best scouts, right? They're, they're going to be out there kind of leading the way. Uh, it's either them or the Neverlooks. The Neverlooks would also potentially be good scouts because they can get themselves in trouble and potentially get themselves out of it, too. We saw how important energy was on the playtest, and that was just one zone, right? If the distance between things that matter is great, then I think the Everlooks wind up being pretty strong, actually. The only other thing is, like, horses exist, so that potentially cuts into their niche a little bit. So it's hard to say. I think they have potential to be strong at the same time. They're not specific enough. They have, like, the opposite problem that some of the other ones do. Like, some are too specific. They're almost too broad without any real... They don't offer anything unique enough to where you'd really want to play one. This is going to be really based on how big the world is, how it's designed. Do you really need that extra pool of energy to get around? You might. And then, then they're going to be like incredibly powerful. 
But if you don't, then they're like totally useless. Hammer? It's interesting to hear Virtual talk about how he's not a huge fan of these guys. Because I think that these guys are potentially one of my favorite halflings. And that's just because their general ability in just about any circumstance. Everyone, oh well, I don't want to say everybody's going to be running. Uh, in the playtest, I was running more than I should have. I, I really shouldn't have been running. I should have been saving my energy. But these guys won't be using energy as much when they run. For instance, when we were chasing down deer or chasing down rabbits, I was clubbing deer and I was running. And I would have been able to progress a lot quicker had I have had that energy or had energy not been an issue with that. Kind of like we mentioned in the very beginning when we were talking about the usefulness at certain points in the game, I think that these guys will also have a massive, massive advantage in the very beginning of the game when trying to place down deeds, because these guys are going to be able to get places that other people more than likely can't. Yeah, that's kind of where my mind's at with these guys. I'd honestly throw them at probably upper B. Upper B sounds pretty reasonable. I'd probably put them between the orcs and the dwarves. I'm good with that. Okay. I think halflings are just going to be B class. That that too, yeah. like it's 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 still a halfling, right? It's All still right. the large armor shop of oh. the exemplar <laughs> to your video. <laughs> I am probably the number one fan of large armor shops. Just saying, girl will buy yeah. them all. Oh, I will definitely buy absolutely zero large armor shops. At least they did respond to that though, right? And said that the shops are going to be where they you did. actually sell. If they're not quite as bad, they're actually not bad at all now yeah. because. Yeah, they they kind of nerf the forges a bit. <laughs> yeah, during that AMA. So, well, the forges were too good, right? If they were gonna like craft everything and sell everything, then you didn't need shops, right? At least armor and weapon shop. Okay, up next we have the Mumsens. Again, another exemplar similar to the Never Look, similar to the Clear Bloods. I don't know if you guys ever played Assassin, the video game. It was a cool game, and there was places where you had to sneak to be able to finish a level, like you couldn't just run around, you have to like sneak around. So these guys are the the sneakers. <laughs> <laughs> they have still passage buff, move in almost complete silence, which I think, again, let's say there's a treasure or a certain area and it's just filled with dangerous creatures and you can sneak in, do something or get something and be able to sneak out without getting caught. There's definitely some value and utility to that, right? I think just rushing in and zerging everything and just going chaotic is not always going to be the best answer. Again, I think it's one of these exemplars that in certain situations is going to be the right one to use. But overall, I'd still probably throw it middle of the B tier. I would completely agree with what you had to say. I don't think that these guys are anything... Um... Super special. I don't own one. I'm not going to buy one. But I also see where they would be useful in certain circumstances. What's interesting, or I guess thought provoking with these guys is why or in what way could they get past something? Um, is it how will the aggro mechanic work? Do they have to look at you to attract their aggro? Or can you run right behind them and them not notice you? Because that would actually, that'd be kind of cool. But yeah, still not a huge fan. Yeah, I would kind of put these with the Neverlooks and their scouters or potentially ones that can, or exemplars that can get to areas that maybe other ones don't have easy access to. I, I think what you said about aggro range, I, I think Alem said something similar in another video where maybe the since they can move in silence, they won't trigger mobs as easily. So you can kind of run between things a little bit without getting caught. Seems oddly specific. Other than sneaking around and doing things, they don't seem to have any other utility beyond that yeah i i think these are pretty much with the never looks maybe slightly better only because the never look is like got hit and oh shit on it they get in trouble these guys uh, ideally don't get in trouble to begin with what do you guys think about here like it yep i like it okay up next we have another mom favorite the proud hurts yeah we own almost 17 percent of the proud hurts Obviously for mom, absolutely S tier. And, and I do think it's A tier because again, to craft hot meals, you're gonna need them and hot meals are gonna be a hot ticket in Miranda. So definitely uh, one of the best halflings, if not the best. Uh, so A tier for sure. And definitely one of the most important uh, exemplars in the game because you're gonna have reduced energy costs when cooking and brewing. 
So that's an interesting description, right? I mean, can every exemplar cook and brew? I don't know, but again, for us at Mom, it's going to be very important. So they excel at cooking incredible meals very quickly. So for production of hot meals, this is it. Hammer. Okay, before I go too deep into my thought process here, have has there been an answer on on energy regain? Like when you sleep, is it going to take time or is it going to be an instant thing you just have to pay? Do you guys know? It's going to be, uh, I think, instant. Instant. Okay, all right. Because what would keep a regular exemplar from having a bed nearby, maybe in in the building across from him, and just sleeping and then coming back and brewing, just purely speaking of um, energy cost when cooking or brewing. It'll be highly inefficient, right? I mean, if you're trying to say craft 50 meals or 100 meals, I, I don't know how many meals you can craft before you need to uh, get your stamina back up. But yeah, it's, it's hard to say without seeing the, the details of the mechanics. But yeah, I, I see what you're getting at. But I still think they're going to get a speed buff based on their description when cooking speed's gonna matter yeah no that definitely makes sense and this is another one where i there's 800 of these guys i like them because they do create consumables but the fact that everyone else is going to be able to create consumables is also kind of or they're also going to be able to cook these guys will have the, the, the benefit and i think these guys would be really useful in like taverns or something i think that's kind of ideally where they're supposed to be so i like them uh, but I still, I don't think that they're, they're S tier by any means. I'd, I'd probably put them upper B for me. They're crafters and they're going to be the top crafters of the food market, right? I think that makes them pretty strong. Just like the Iron Shapers are the top crafters for the ore market. These are the top crafters of the food market and they're rarer. And there's a lot of food buildings. There's only 800 of these. So they will be in high demand, not only in those buildings, but in the top tier of those buildings too. Because they should be able to outproduce and potentially produce higher quality or in greater quantities when they do craft. I think they are quite strong. Rose colored glasses are not. These are top of the A tier for me. I put them above the Iron Shapers. I don't think they quite touch S class. I still think the Long Songs are uh, a little better only because potentially Long Songs could even buff people in buildings or farms. And so they have like immense utility. Too much to ignore. But Pride Hearts to me are just, just behind them. Top of the A, maybe bottom of S. I, I think probably top of A class. I think these are going to be the most in-demand crafters in the whole game. Like, by quite a bit. There you go. I'm good with top of the A. I'm all right with an A. All right, so that finishes up the halflings. And up next, we have the cream of the crop with the very shiny profile pictures, the elves. And the first yeah. one... Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say it's interesting. There's like two different types of pictures for the elves the darker ones and then the brighter ones so yeah yeah if you look at the humans the true providers have like a little different right it's like a little lighter mm -hmm. yeah it's kind of interesting i guess some of the dwarves have some lighter ones too oh maybe all the dwarves are lighter yeah yeah so up first we have the bright sun elves first of all i think all elves are s tier automatically so really we're just going to be debating <laughs> where they fall Probably the worst elf. I, I think it is because, I mean, yes, they're going to get a buff during the day, but I think the most valuable, it, it's already confirmed that the most valuable gameplay is going to happen at night. So for that reason, I would put it at the bottom of the elf ranking at the S tier. And I, I would probably put all the elves above the long song. That's where I put it. So I would put it right above the long song personally. Hammer. Yeah, so I actually, I like these guys. Um, I think that they're going to be the number one tank in the game, more than likely, um, based on the information that I understand anyway. But that's, you know, that's in daylight. If we're not in daylight, then these guys will kind of struggle. So, and a lot of fighting, I think, depending on who you are and what you're doing, could be done at night. So I could also see where this guy's kind of rendered useless at times. Or not useless, but uh, not as useful. I definitely say above the long song, but yeah, I, I might put him as I might put him as the worst elf, but we'll we'll see about that. Yeah, like you said, definitely potentially the best tank, and they may not suck when they're not in daylight. They might this might be only an elf. You know, right. they could be completely 
bonkers during the daytime where they're more powerful than anything. Again, it's one of those situations where until we have more information, it's hard to kind of say. I think it would be nice to own one dark, at least one dark sun and one bright sun, just so you can cover both day and night cycles. Especially um, if the day cycle winds up being longer. I know they talked about being 50-50, but you know, that can always change. If the day cycle winds up being longer, then they'll be better than the average elf more than 50% of the time. That, that's got some value, too. They also could potentially be the healers. If they're not the tanks, they could also be the best healers in the game as well. So I, I think the Bright Elves are maybe a little underrated, actually, and pretty strong. They're definitely the top example we've run across at this point. Where they fit in among the elves, I'm still not 100%. I, I think they have potential to be quite strong, or like you were saying, they could be kind of the worst of the elf, especially if they're that much weaker without their daylight buffs. I own three of them, so I hope you're right. And I, I like the, the strategy of dark sun, bright sun. I mean, it could be, that could be the meta, you know what I mean? That could be the most powerful gameplay strategy. Up next, this was the first elf I had ever purchased and I bought it off the store when it dropped, and that is an Earthlight elf. Yeah, so with a, almost all the classes, there's a, one of the exemplars that has or uses less energy, and this is the elf that uses the less energy to cast. So, yeah, definitely valuable. I'm assuming casting spells is going to require a lot of energy. So in terms of a long, prolonged battle, they could be really quite valuable. Um, so yeah, Hammer, what's your thoughts? So I actually really like this guy. When I was picking up my my elf, I was really having a hard time choosing between the Earthlight and the Everflow. And that's because both of them sound like they're going to potentially be the best DPS in the game. These guys are going to be able to cast more spells. It's going to be more expensive materium-wise, potentially, to, to rock these guys. But I think that they're going to be able to output damage that no one else can. I really like him. Obviously, S. I think he's number two for me. So they're more efficient in spell casting, which means they potentially can cast spells that no other exemplars in the game could cast. You know, let's say you have... 200 energy and a spell costs 225, then the only person that'll have access to that would be an Earthlight. I think that they'll be good for long, prolonged fights. Also, since they're more efficient, like you said, they could potentially continue DPSing into longer fights. I don't think they'll be top DPS. I think that's going to belong to the next example, the Everflow, just based on kind of how that their trait works. This is going to be one of the top couple spell casting exemplars in the game. I don't see any reason why they wouldn't be this absolutely incredibly powerful they're an elf and a magic user that that's pretty much all i need to know <laughs> this is this is uh, our top exemplar at the moment for sure so just, just playing these elves are going to allow you to do things that you can't do on the other characters more than likely you know the elves should be the bulk this the class that you stack for these high tier raids just because uh, their stats and damage are going to be much much higher at least with what we currently hey maybe they do things and some of the lower classes are strong but i, I can't see them taking something so rare and valuable and making it weaker than, you know, a pit fighter. All right, up next we have uh, kind of the Earthlake's counterpart, the uh, the other big spellcaster, the Everflow Elf. I got to hand it over to Hammer because this is his elf, his exemplar, and he's going to make build the bull case for it, so go for it. Yes, all right, so this is the best exemplar in the game objectively and i don't care what anyone else has to say <laughs> um no this is this is my favorite exemplar um and this is the elf that i ended up getting when i was trying to decide which one i wanted and that was because he has a bonus to casting speed and bonus to casting speed which means you're going to be able to output a lot more damage quicker now where the earthlight could be better is he could cast more powerful um, spells that maybe this guy wouldn't be able to, but the Everflow is going to be able to, I think I think he'll be able to do more damage in the short term. Uh, I, I don't know if there's going to be, I mean, there could be some spells that are just too, too energy costly to, to use, but I think the Everflow is going to be the best DPS. Yeah, so that's why I ended up getting him. And it's not just DPS, it just says bonus to casting speed now that could be healing magic that could be um that could be any kind of magic we don't really know how magic is going to work so these guys could be the best 
healers in the game. They could be the best DPS in the game. They could be the best uh, potentially tanks in the game if they're casting protection spells. We have no idea. But these guys are going to cast spells the fastest. So that's why I think these guys are the best exemplars in the game. There's definitely an argument for that being the best. I don't have too much more to add to that. I pretty much agree with what you said. They're going to offer the most, the quickest and most exciting gameplay for the Magic casters too, which most people tend to like that that kind of play style too. So, yeah, no, I think these are definitely in the running for the best. I think that really, I mean, it's really hard to say other than the Bright Suns, which are a little more murky. I think the the last four could all potentially be the top one. Depends on the situation and how things are in game. But we can put these slightly above the Earthlights just because I think they'll be a little more popular. And potentially a little bit stronger uh, as well. Can you create a double S tier? <laughs> no, no double S tier. Do you, do you mean an Everflow tier? Yeah, just the Everflow tier. That's what we should call okay. it. Yeah. Yeah, G tier, God tier. <laughs> so, yeah, no. So the next is the All Sight Elves. And I'm torn right now, honestly. I'm torn. My original plan, which I'm questioning, was cycling between all sight in in the day and in dark sun at night but i'm questioning everything after doing this video <laughs> might do bright sun dark sun i don't know we'll see everflow I, i've got all the elves so we'll see but i like shooting things i'm very curious to see what the buffs are going to be is the target range bigger is the range of combat bigger how good does shooting things feel honestly in the last play test it was a little bit rough to use the bow their description is definitely one of the more interesting ones um, it is said they exist across time, letting them focus on something inside of our future. I don't know if that's just a cool copy that they crafted. Their ability is bonus to ranged weapons. So again, depending how good ranged weapons will be, they'll probably become my exemplar of choice during the day. And, you know, we saw how important from a strategic perspective range combat was. So in terms of a group, I definitely think you want some all sights, soften up the target as you're approaching, and then go for the kill as you're getting in close. But yeah, grill thoughts. Yeah, um, the play test is a little revealing in terms of at least currently where they're at with range combat. With, with people being able to block shots, there's not a lot to shoot out now. You know, you can always take high ground. People jumping, giant orcs in the way. Your actual, your potential DPS could be like quite low. Obviously, their elves, all the elves are going to be magical and they can maybe enchant weapons to seek. You know, maybe they don't miss, right? Maybe they go through their items, their arrows pass through allies. So they, they could have some things that make them quite strong. And if they are, do, can do that, then they will be, in general, uh, archer, hunter, range type classes uh, tend to be very strong in MMOs. You know, maybe they have a class that turns them into somewhere, something like a hunter from WoW where they have a pet and that can tank for them. Uh, which would make them amazing soloists, like maybe the best in the game, as they tend to be in those type of, in these type of games. But yeah, as it currently stands, I, I think the potential is there for them to be among the best or the very best. But right now, they seem a little sketchier. I'd still probably put it above the Bright Sun, just because in general, Rage Combat is incredibly strong. And not that Bright Suns aren't Rage Combat too; they could be spellcasters. But they're also the only physical. Or somewhat physical class of the elves. The other ones seem more magical. I guess maybe Dark Suns. Though the one clip of the Dark Sun, it looks more like a warlock than it does a, a range class or a melee class. Yeah, I would probably put these behind. Probably put like the all sites like here. Behind the two main spellcasters above the Bright Sun. With potential to move up or down, depending on a lot of factors. Yes. So I did want to add, uh, you summed it up or you said it very well. But there is one thing that I want to add. A lot of people are in the argument of who's the better DPS, All Sight versus Everflow. But that aside, you just like general usefulness, the Everflow is, and I guess the Earthlight as well, they're going to be able to cast spells. And we don't know if spells are purely going to be damage, if they could be healing, if they could be defense, you know, what the spells will actually look like versus the All Sight is only going to be able to do damage. Although, you know, th these two might be fighting for number one for the actual DPS, I still think your positioning's great because the Everflow and the um, Earthlight could potentially heal or do other things as well. That's something we haven't mentioned. Like I mentioned with the All Sight, they can people block spells. Well, what happens if people block spells too? 
or block, you know, arrows for the old yeah, sites. Right. That's if people yep. block spells, then they're going to have the same same issue. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Right, right now, now I know they added arrows. They showed some pictures of arrows in the most recent. Was it the most recent anime or the one before? I can't remember. Where, you know, the arrows had damage and they'll add damage. But it, the, the, the blocking issue to me is the biggest problem with the ranged combat right now. Now, you can develop strategies. Melee gets on two sides of a mob, and then the range classes stand at its flanks and fire in that way. Things moving around, it takes time. Just things moving around in general. You know, this is not like click and then hit something like it is in WoW or a lot of MMOs. You're going to have to aim, and if you miss, and if something's running around, you're definitely, you're, your hit rate's not going to be as high. It's just, that's, that's it. So there's some potential issues there as well. I'm curious to see how they develop range combat going forward based off of what we saw in the playtest. Yeah, I don't see them eliminating the blockage. I mean, that would just make it unrealistic, and we know they want to try to make things realistic, so. All righty. Yeah. Last one. Last but not least, my personal favorite, the Dark Sun. Well, according to OpenSea, this is the top elf right historically it's had the highest prices a lot of people are completely obsessed and passionate about it and i think we we got to build the bull case and the bear case for the dark sun obviously the bull case is you can see at night we again already know that nighttime is going to be the most valuable gameplay time so that's the bull case for it here's the bear case for it lanterns and a lot of people can, let's say, manipulate their computer visual settings to be able to see at night. Now, maybe not as good as the Dark Sun can, but it's hard to say, right? Is the Dark Sun going to have other buffs at night? If they do, then that would be transformative, right? If they can only see better, I'm actually not as bullish as I was in the past because we saw how bright the lanterns were, and I, and I do own a lantern. So maybe rocking an Everflow with a Lantern at night is, is the best move. So I'm a little torn. We'll see how it plays out. But um, yeah, I mean, it definitely sounds like it's going to be a really good one. But I don't know if it's going to be the best one if you own a Lantern. Hammer? Yeah, you said it well when you said that the lanterns could potentially really dampen this guy's abilities or uh, rain on his parade. I'm not a big fan of these guys, even though they have, as you said, been the number one seller on OpenSea. And I've always like been confused by that a little bit. I mean, not really. I can see why they're selling for a good amount, but I still think that the other, I think that the three elves on the top right now are going to be better in the game. So I'm, I want to hear Grill combat this real fast. Let's see what he has to say. If they get buffs at night, then they're going to be absolutely freaking bonkers because night's going to have the most creatures, better loot, and these guys will just be loving it at night. They're going to be able to farm the hardest stuff at the hardest time for the most profit. I think that alone makes them quite powerful and potentially better than the others. They also, if they're melee classes or if they're better at melee and not spellcasters, that alone is the strong right now Like from what we've experienced. We can only go by that. Now, even the spell, if spellcasters wind up getting their spells blocked, then they're going to run up in the same... They can do a little DPS in the world, but it doesn't make a difference if you're hitting or an orc in the back of the head <laughs> with your fireball a hundred times, you know, or your ice lance or whatever. If they don't get buffed at night, then and if it's only a visual thing, then I don't think they're very strong at all. But that said, I don't see that being the case. I think they're going to be kind of the opposite of the Bright Suns, right? Bright Suns gets buffed during the day. Dark Suns will get buffed at night. My opinion would be the most profitable, but Anything can change. Yeah, if they, if they get the nighttime buffs, it's the top exemplar in the game, in my opinion. Um, I would sadly if they agree. Don't, if they don't, if they just see things better, <clears throat> then I think Everflow at a Lantern is better. Earthlight's probably better. It all depends. Again, McCarthy, Jason, if you're listening, please clarify for us in the next AMA. We'd, we'd appreciate it. There's also the Benny Factor, right? It's always the Benny Factor. Yeah, well, this is the Benefactor Benny Factor. He bought a ton of these, right? Like seven or eight or nine, I can't remember. He, he cleared out the rest of the tier on Dark Suns. So kind of like the Clear Bloods, these have uh, the uh, kind of the Benny Factor X Factor. As, uh -huh. as they say, follow the money. 
I'm gonna put number one. There you go. Boom. Yeah. Hammer's disappointed. <laughs> I'm gonna put little crying emojis <laughs> on the Everflow Elf. Well, that's because you haven't put the Ever Everflow tier up top first. Oh, that's right, right, that's right. We're out of space. I'll fix that later. Don't worry about it. Okay, cool. Yeah, make sure you edit that in. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> well, gentlemen, we've done it. Uh, and congrats. This is officially the longest mom video ever. So yeah, it was great having you on, Hammer. We'll definitely have you on again in the future. If you haven't checked out Hammer's channel, uh, Hammer, what do they need to search for to uh, pull up your channel in, in YouTube? Uh, just check out Hammer Hammond on YouTube. I actually think it's Hammer Hammond 23 on YouTube. I post all about Mirandas and it's it's a fun time. Uh, all the videos are speculation, kind of like this channel. And yeah, I, uh, I also am the developer of Mirandas Hub. And if you haven't checked out Mirandas Hub, I highly recommend it. It's got a ton of information about Mirandas. The latest update is actually pretty cool. I made a deed builder so you can go on and you can choose which deed you have or, or want to design. And then you can pick out the buildings to place on it. So lots of fun awesome. on both YouTube and the website. I went to Mirandas Hub and it changed my life. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> i will i will post post the links to your channel and your website in the description so check it out and of course go to join the most powerful guild in the world of mirandas which hammer is a member of as well go to masters or check the links in the description we are open for everyone whether you own assets or not whether you own deeds own exemplars Again, we have a place for you. So join us, masterdematerium.com. Thank you, gentlemen. This was an awesome video, and I think people are going to get a lot of value out of it. See you next time. See you guys.